Welcome to Front Royal Presbyterian's online virtual service. We're glad that you've joined us for worship today. If you take some time to say hello in the chat section below, I know that people would love to see, to hear that you're there and listening in and enjoying the fellowship of meeting with friends that probably haven't seen in forever. My friends, we have a lot to be thankful for because at dinner together this week, Jill was sick, not COVID, and everybody pitched in. So huge thank you to everybody that helped with dinner together. We served all of our meals except for three and then all of our deliveries, of course. And so there were a lot of people that were hungry that were fed because of your generosity. Thank you. I want to remind you that um, we will be finishing the floors here in the church at some point, um, and we will keep you updated as to when the office will be closed. You can check the website for that. I had a St. Luke's board meeting, and there's a new St. Luke's cookbook out. <coughs> I'll be picking some of those up, and if you would like to purchase a St. Luke's cookbook, it's a new version from the last one, you may contact the church office, and you can get it from us. We're excited to support St. Luke's and all that they do for the community, and of course, our very own Dr. Arani was instrumental in getting that clinic started. In the next few weeks, we're going to be studying Jeremiah. And if you'd like to know a little bit more to supplement the sermons, I'm starting a Jeremiah page on the website. So you, each week I'll add another little tidbit so you can just get a feel for even more in depth as to who Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, was. And finally, thank you for understanding about in-person worship last week. Isabel is doing fine. She is back at school. We wanted to make sure quarantine was strict, and as well as Misty had COVID, on top of all the other things that she's had all twice, she is back in the office and beginning to feel better. Everybody gets a negative test before they re-enter the building, and we are still masking. We'll keep you updated if any of that changes. My friends, it is a glorious day to worship the Lord our God. try to love God, God loves us. Before we ever learn to see with compassion and courage, God has a vision for us. Before we ever fail to live up to false expectations, God has a way for us. Before we ever give of ourselves for the sake of someone else, God empties God's self for us. Before we ever are formed in the womb, God knows us. The Prayer of Confession. God of tender mercies, we admit that sometimes we don't know what to do with ourselves. We anger at the slightest insults and imagine great vengeance upon those who wronged us. We laze about in the good news of our faith and do not consider the depth commitment of faith. We care for ourselves, but not for others. Forgive us, we pray. Forgive us, help us to repent, and make us whole. Amen. Oh, 
He also tells us to go forgive others. My friends, know that you are forgiven and be at peace. favorites and I'm sure many of yours. Love comes in many forms. Parental love, God's love, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans, and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor, and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It doesn't demand its own way. It's not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is, is love. I hope you enjoyed today's illustrated Bible. What's your favorite example of love from the Bible? Let us know in the comments below. Be sure to like this video and subscribe. You know where else you can find Superbook? Where? On Facebook and superbook.cbn.com. <laughs> the call to offering. We have been called to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Let us return a portion of the gifts we have been given to God's ministry and those most in need of love. Let us pray. Like water falls from the sky or snow in the winter, you, O oh Lord, are gracious in your love for each one of us. And we give thanks that you see it fit to bless us more than we can begin to count. So continue with your blessings, Lord, and bless the money and the hands and the feet and those hearts that are here today. Gather it all in and use it to the service of your son in your kingdom. Amen. Praise God Corinthians 13 in the New International Version. 
If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardships that I may boast, but do not have love, I am nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others and is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, it keeps no recording of wrong. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always persevere. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we, sh then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love.
As we go to God in prayer today, I have a few prayer requests that are additional. Um, Marta asked us to pray for her friend Judy, who has stage one breast cancer. We continue to keep the Bundy family in our prayers as we updated in chat section last week, her brother did die from COVID. So Joan, you are in our prayers. Tracy Rainey is recovering from foot surgery. We continue to keep Pat Lee and Richard Johansson in our prayers. And as our community is shaken by yet another tragedy, we keep the families of the four boys that were capsized in the Chicoteague Bay last weekend. Many of you know Laura, Rita's good friend, who has been here like she's our own child. Laura's brother was the one that was found dead. We continue to keep all of you in our prayers. Let's go to God. Truly, Lord, you are one God almighty. You are the God of heaven and earth, the God that knew us before we were formed in our mother's womb. You are the God that walks with us through the deep waters, and you are the God that walks with us through the storms. We praise you and glorify your name. We give you thanks, Lord, for the blessings of today, tomorrow, of the past, and each day to come. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, which we cannot begin to grasp in its entirety, that you would send your son to die for our sins when we still would not confess that we were broken. Lord, that grace is unimaginable. And as we receive that grace, open our eyes to the good news, the truth of the gospel that tells us over and over again that we are loved. Today, in this time, those are the words that people need to hear. You are loved. Help us to share that, to spread that grace, to, to speak a kind word and give a kind act. In the midst of these times, Lord, be with us as we continue to, to work together as a community, live together as a community, even though we are not together in person. We give you praise, Lord, that we know your hand is in all things. And we ask you to be with us as we continue to go through this time of COVID. Give us wisdom. Give us courage. And dare we ask for you to give us answers so that we might hear who we are to be in this time and who we are to be as we move forward. We ask you, Lord, because you are the God of all and everything. We ask you to keep peace in Eastern Europe, especially in Russia and Ukraine. Help leaders to speak before picking up guns and weapons of war. Help us to listen and find a way forward that doesn't include the loss of life. Give Putin and our President Biden strength, courage, and wisdom. We thank you, Lord, that we have been blessed with so many wonderful people in our lives, but when that person is taken from us unexpectedly, the grief is overbearing. As they walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we ask you to be with Joan and her family. And when young life is taken, it's even more tragic. So we ask you to give your peace to Laura and her family the family of the missing boy and the two that survived. Lord, when this type of tragedy happens, we seek for answers and when we find none, sometimes our doubts begin to take over. May their faith continue to be strong. Might you make yourself known to them in these days of waiting, of grieving, of crying, of remembering. We give you thanks, Lord, for family. And we know that there is no sorrow if at one point we also didn't have joy. So we give you thanks for those moments of happiness, as fleeting as they might be. We give you thanks that you break into our daily lives, show us grace and love and truth and the gospel. And we ask you to do that for those that are facing uncertainties in the future, like Judy, and Pat and Richard. In their days, Lord, may you comfort them when days are difficult 
and rejoice with them when days are good. We are a, not just a church family, Lord. We are a family of God. And we give thanks that you call us your own. Today and all days, Lord, help us to worship and to praise. Help us to confess and receive forgiveness and also to forgive others. Help us to sing songs in our heart of the good news and help us when this worship is over to go and spread the good news to others. Empower us, Lord. Use our feet and hands as your own to bring about your kingdom in this world. Through your son's name we pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, as he is known. His book is found right after Isaiah, which of course is my favorite prophet. But it's always good to look at prophets and see how they mix into our world as well as in theirs, because their words are oftentimes still profound today. This is Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, of the priests, who were in Ananoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of King Hosiah, son of Ammon of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of King Jehoiakim, son of Josiah of Judah, and until the end of the eleventh year of King Zedekiah, son of Hosiah of Judah, until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you. Do not, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand, touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. The word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot tilted away from the north. My friends, the prophet Isaiah says, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, your word comes and oftentimes we shrink away from it. You call us to speak a word into life today, and yet we are fearful of the response of people. Give us the strength and the courage of Jeremiah. And more so than that, Lord, look over the words that we speak. May they be words of love instead of words of hatred. Through your son's name. Amen. What do you want to be when you grow up? It's a fun question. It's, I always look at it in terms of what do I want to be when I grow up, because I've still got some growing up to be. One of my favorite quotes is Matthew McConaughey, when he received an award, somebody, at, he told the story, he said, somebody asked me who my hero is, and I tell them it is me 10 years from now. And the reason why is because his hero is something he has to work towards, something he has to be. And so who is his hero in 10 years but himself 10 years later? And they say that you'll change your career, the average person, five times within their adult life. I've changed mine twice, so I have three more to go. If you have any suggestions, let me know. And, you know, the, we ask kids all the time, and I love their answers. We can ask kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? If you have meet a child on the street, it's usually one of the first questions we ask. And so I asked on social media the same question, and I got some interesting response. One mother said her son, at age eight, wanted to be a T-Rex. Good luck. One woman, I love this one, it's a church member, she wants to be a little old lady who gives everyone a run for their money and is honorary as ever in the nursing home. Don't we all want to be that person? How about a mad scientist that's always home in time for dinner? A killer whale trainer? No thanks. A class A truck driver with a chimpanzee as a co-pilot? I thought that was funny. That's another church member. And I love this one. This is a previous kid of mine in, in Charlotte, a third shift cook at Waffle House. I don't know why the third shift is so much better. It sounds to me like I should be asleep. Sometimes the answers are telling of the life in which they live. And the Waffle House apparently is a very popular way to, place to work. And one child said, I want to be a prisoner. And when I get out, I want to work at the Waffle House. Just imagine the life that he lives that makes that answer. Many times, kids just want to be like their parents. Sadly, neither of my kids want to be a minister. But when Jacob was little, and we used to have it hanging on the wall at home, he said, when I grow up, I want to be an old, bald guy that wears suits like my dad. Sometimes we just follow in the footsteps of what is around us. So here's a fun little video about the kids and what they want to be when they grow up. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be... Hey, I never think I thought of that. Uh, let me think about that. Whoa. I want to be a teacher when I grow up. Elementary teacher. I like little kids. A babysitter. A pastor. A dolphin trainer. A gentle without each bunch. A hair cutter. A person who helps ch in charities. I'm a cashier at Walmart. An author. Chapter books about mythical creatures and animals and things. I want to be a lawyer. Lawyer. Pilot. Pilot. Pilot? And a dad? A pilot racer dad? Scientist. Scientist. Paleontologist. Mind for dinosaur bones and studies them. YouTuber. Movie star. A famous actor. 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 Mm -hmm. On stage. On TV. On Disney Channel. For commercials. I gotta be a model. Model. I'll work it. If I want a model, I'll just be a policeman. Police. 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 Police officer. A cop. I want to car chases. Cash bad guys. A superhero. Batman. Spider-Man. I would like to go into the U.S. Army because my grandma, she loved the Army, but she never went into the service. I want to be third African-American gymnast. Gymnastic coach. I want to be a professional dancer. 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 Dance teacher. Ballerina. Professional soccer player. I have a shirt on right now that says Barcelona. Soccer player. Basketball player. Basketball, football, or soccer player. Or I baseball. I can never choose. Mm. I do not know. I'm still working on that. Maybe when I grow up, I'll pick. I already have a whole plan. So the Air Force for 20 years, 
become a businessman, make my own company for cars. I want to be a Pokemon trainer. I want to work at Target. I want a, a cake. I want to be a pop star. Rock star. Singer. 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 Uh, I want to be a cook. A cook. But I don't really know how to actually cook. I want to be an artist. Artist. Painter. I want to be an artist that goes around painting walls. A artist and a video game maker. Video game designer. Video game. I want to be a filmmaker. Um, whatever my dad is. Oh, do you know what your dad is? I'm not sure. I'll be a doctor. 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 A mermaid. A mermaid. Doctor. Hmm. Heart surgeon. Neurosurgeon. Cardiologist. Gynecologist. Pediatrician. The kid's doctor. Pediatrician. And why do you want to do that? I want to be a doctor and then I can wear rainbow sweatpants. I really want to be a nurse. Everyone says you have to be very good at science and math. I'm not really, but I still want to be one. I want to be a pet doctor because I like helping animals. Pet vet. 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 Veterinarian. Veterinarian. Zoologist. Princess fairy zookeeper. How much do you think they get paid? $29. Hmm. Please note, we only had one pastor in that group of kids and not a single prophet. Not a single prophet. Because there's a significant difference between a prophet and a pastor. Not even Jesus wanted to be a prophet because he knew what it would take. He was so much more than a prophet, obviously, as God's son. But when people recognized him to be saying a word that they were not pleased with, as we talked about last week, they attempted to throw him over a cliff. There's a big difference between priest or pastor and prophet. As pastors, we're told to speak the good news, but to also comfort those that are in need. We feed those that are hungry. We offer compassion to a community, and we work to make the world a better place. Being a prophet is not that. A prophet is hard work. Hard work telling people terrible news in the midst of a life that they are accustomed to, that they enjoy, and they 100% do not want to hear what you have to say. A prophet often is constantly preaching doom and gloom and death threats. They get death threats. They get exiled. Their very life is in danger. They have endure complete hatred from those that they love. Look at what happened to Jesus last week. And the possibility of death as they serve is always on the horizon. And this morning, we have this call story from Jeremiah, and most of us know Isaiah's call story. God called to him three times, and on the third time, when Isaiah realized God was calling him, he said those fantastic words, Here I am, Lord, and we have a song about it that makes me cry almost every time we sing it. But that's about it. Nobody else willingly says, When I grow up, I want to be a prophet. Nobody wants to be a prophet. Now, I told you, my favorite prophet is Isaiah, but in an attempt to understand scripture as a whole, we're going to study Jeremiah for the next four weeks. And this book of Jeremiah is solid, and it has a word for today, and I think that's the entire meaning of God's word. Jeremiah was one that had to denounce everything. In fact, one of the translations of Jeremiah which Jeremiah comes from, is thunderous denounce, denunciation. And its origin is no mystery because Jeremiah denounced everybody and everything. He den renounced, denounced the kings and the clergy. He called out the rich for exploiting the poor. He even calls out the poor for not working and deserving better. He denounced each new God that came into their lives. <clears throat> the gods that would come sniffing around like a dog in heat, and they would follow and answer and use that new God as their truth. He denounced those people that had this mumbo-jumbo talk all over the place that went into the temple and came out, and he said those priests, those 
clergy, those people, they need to have their heads examined. They need some serious therapy because mumbo jumbo does not please God. When some of them took to indulging in human sacrifice, which we know to be wrong, he appeared, Jeremiah appears with a clay pot and he throws it down and it breaks and shatters in pieces and he says, this is what God's going to do to you in God's time. He denounced even God himself, that takes guts, for saddling him with a message to a bunch of degenerate ninnies that are not going to pay attention to him. Jeremiah denounces God by saying, you have deceived me. Like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail. He said this, shaking his fist at God, and it kind of reminds me of Job. But people didn't listen. God took it. People didn't listen. When he told them that Babylonians were going to come and rip them apart, and just as they richly deserved, they worked them over and threw them in jail. Well, no, nobody wants to hear that. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that Russia or China or North Korea is going to come and rip us to shreds. Of course, I would throw that person in jail. That's not news I want to hear. He told them at one point, if you're that crazy about circumcision, that serious about it, it's a good thing, I'm not saying it's not, then maybe you should circumcise your heart. Maybe that circumcision should go a little bit higher in your body. Try circumcising, he says, this is a quote, the foreskins of your heart. And the only hope he saw for them was that someday God would put the law in their hearts instead of a book. But he warned that was many years away. At his lowest point, Jeremiah, like Job, cursed the day that he was born. And you could hardly blame him. He had a hard life telling people to shape up with the result that they were now in worse shape than when Jeremiah came on the scene before. He had to tell them to submit to Babylon, submit to the other nation, and fight against your patriotic national instincts to protect yourself. Submit to Babylon. It sounds like treachery, doesn't it? And then the first chance they got, a bunch of them headed over the border into Egypt. And to make it even worse, they pour, pulled Jeremiah, poor old Jeremiah at this point, took him across the border into Egypt, the man who preached against idols, the temple, and the king. They dragged him over into Egypt like he was some good luck charm or rabbit's foot. He was an idol to them. What happened to him in Egypt, we're actually not quite sure. Scripture doesn't tell us exactly what happened, but the stories suggest that his own people stoned him to death, which wouldn't be surprising. So all of this is Jeremiah, and it sounds like it's a horrible way to be a prophet. If Jeremiah had known all that was going to happen, would he have had the chance to say no? No thanks, God, go on to the next person. God got him from the very beginning. How can you say no when God says to you, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you, I appointed you a prophet to the nations. How can you say no to that? Unfortunately, even among us Christian leaders, conversations and scripture such as this one are taken out of context and used for our own political ideology against abortion, of course. And I'm not making a stance on it, I'm just saying that this passage of scripture is, is not about abortion or some political thought. It's God claiming that I know you and I know what the plans I have for you, which is another passage of scripture we're going to study in Jeremiah. I got gotcha. you. But, you know, well, like last week, and the people in the synagogue, we like to be right in our own thoughts and we don't care to listen to others. So... Few of us want to be promoted to profit. If you do, let me know. I'll, I'll send you lots of places. What comforting words can I say when you're called to such a life? And as clergy, of course, everybody always asks us our call stories. I'm not going to share mine with you. It's not that exciting. 
But the one thing we always tr say when somebody is sharing their call and struggling with their call from God is, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. And that is exactly what that passage of scripture means. When he says, before you were born, I knew you, which means, okay, you're born and you're not qualified. Jeremiah knew he wasn't. He was but a boy, suggestions. Some say under 10, probably more like 14 to 17 years old when he got his call. But God knew from the beginning. Jeremiah was not qualified, but a child. Granted, he grew up in a priestly home. In fact, that's all he would have known. But as I said, priests and prophets are two different beasts. But a boy, his story begins. Now this is a poem by Michael Coffey, and I thought it was really powerful. He heard a voice that only men hear when ears open, put down his blue lightsaber, removed his holster and belt, disassembled his Lego kingdom castle, and retired his knights and horses boxed up the green army men with frozen pea faces and decommissioned the generals and their monochrome medals, put his red-tipped pistol in the garbage with the Mountain Dew and tossed the paper tape caps and plasticized badge. The boy heated his interior for the first time and convulsed at the call to be strong in word and muscle and heart and will. The yearning to do holy things for magnanimous purposes and drop pretense and armor and put his own flesh on. He looked at his father's leathered hands, his uncle's gray hair and his grandfather's worn out body. He weighed the heft of work ahead against the helium frivolity of youth and so he said to the spirit that haunted him, oh boy, he said, it looks too hard for this boy. And the spirit said to the one naked without toys, you are a man. I love it. I just love the images of, of putting the toys away and a childhood and all of a sudden being called into this prophet. God responds with words we ought to remember and hear when we doubt ourselves. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. How do you say no to that? Jeremiah was most definitely a reluctant prophet. And to be honest, that's the best kind. For if you're reluctant, you know what is actually required of you in the days ahead. You understand the truth of what you have to preach and teach and say. Maybe we should all be a little more reluctant going forward. My experience, people do crazy things for one of two reasons. One, they're madly head over heels in love. The second is they have a surefire, solid, and firm sense of call. And as a side note, I know you always love to hear call stories from clergy, but clergy are not the only ones that have call stories. I wouldn't go so far as to say that an eight-year-old wanting to be a T-Rex or drive a semi with a chimpanzee as a co-pilot is typically a calling from God, but we are called into different places in our worlds. And as we're called into those different places, we too are called to be a prophet of sorts, to preach the truth in the middle of a world that has lost its faith. I'll be honest with you. My first calling wasn't to be a minister. Since I was little, my first calling was always to be a mom. Calls like Jeremiah's don't come often, yet they do. When in your vocation, wherever it might be, Jeremiah's call and yours is to speak the truth into a world that is in deep denial of its faithful reality. And if that isn't today, I don't know what is. To speak a word of truth to a world that is in deep denial of the faithful reality with God. No doubt. Poor Jeremiah had almost every prophet in humankind's history, their knowledge, their truth, but every single one of them begins with, except for Isaiah, not me, not now, 
I'm not qualified, I'm too old, I'm too young. And I've been asked a thousand times when friends or family look on me and they see me exhausted, frustrated, and stressed. Carrie, have you ever thought of doing something other than ministry? That's a fair question. I wonder who else I could be. <laughs> but my answer is always the same. God hasn't given me clear instructions on what to do next. To which Jeremiah answers the same. Nothing more could be said. And so begins the story of Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. All glory be to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. My friends, go from your couches, your kitchens. Go from wherever you are, spread the good news. Have the courage of Jeremiah and the strength and the wisdom that comes from God alone to speak the truth into a world that is in rapid denial of who we are called to be in the covenant with God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Oh,